We're going to be looking at John 20, verses 1 through 10, again, back to life. And um, John Calvin sums it up really well. He says, the resurrection of Christ is the most important article of our faith, and without it, the hope of eternal life is extinguished. I want, to, I, want you, I, want to, I want to read that again, and I want, you, I want it to sit with you for a moment. The resurrection of Christ is the most important article of our faith, and without it, the hope of eternal life is extinguished. Think about this. As a result of a man being murdered 2,000 years ago, you are here. Right? That's, that's why we gather together. Because of a man who was murdered 2,000 years ago and came back to life. Now our world worships and honors men who are still in their graves. But we worship the one who has defeated death and is very much alive today. So with that being said, uh, if you're a note taker, there, there are three points. There's, we're going to be looking at a first, first sight, closer look, and seeing clearly. Let's go ahead and pray. God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we thank you for your word, and Lord, I pray that all distractions can be just set aside, and Lord, that we can focus on your word. God, I, I pray that you speak to us, Lord, that you speak um, clearly, and you, and you break us, and you convict us of where we have sinned against you, Lord, where we need to repent. God, I pray that as we study your resurrection, God, that it will change us and we will not leave here the same. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so I want to look at um, the first two verses of John 20. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Or we see Mary Magdalene, right? She sees the grave site and she sees a stone rolled away. Now what's interesting is the Greek word here used to describe Mary's first impression is is blepo. Right? And the simplest use of this word simply means to see, that she's Physically observing. She's observing that a stone has been rolled away. She's taking note of something. So it's quite literal that Mary Magdalene sees the gravesite has been tampered with. And watch how she responds. Verse 2. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. There's a couple things I want to point out right when we look at this. But I find it interesting that the writer uses Mary Magdalene as one who stumbles upon the grave. Right? As the rest of the disciples out of fear have scattered and have run away, fearing that they will be persecuted, Mary Magdalene, right, she doesn't abandon the mission. She's not disassociating herself with Jesus by rejecting him. Right? She goes to the gravesite. And she approaches. Now, in this point in history, and given the culture, right, this, it would have been embarrassing for the Jewish writer to make a claim that a woman was the first witness. Right? Women were not given the same social status as men, and so this would have been embarrassing to admit this. While they were away and scattered out of fear, a woman was not. So this Mary actually gets to lay eyes on Jesus later in the narrative. And and there's something, there's importance, I think. I think it shows God's grace here a bit. But understand, Mary Magdalene is one who has a a shady shady past. She has a troubled past. And yet Jesus uses her. Right, whether it's by grace or whether it's, and, and the writer I think is pointing this out to show his authenticity. Understand, women weren't even allowed to, their word did not count in court. 
right? That's how women were seen. They were not even allowed to testify in court, yet God is using a woman. And the writer John is not afraid to admit it. If they were to make this resurrection story up, they never would have inserted Mary Magdalene as a witness to the resurrection. Rather, they would have showed themselves as great men of faith. Bold, with no fear, following the crucified Christ. But yet what we see is gospel writers highlighting their weaknesses. They're showing you that they were scared. Yet promoting the strength of the socially weak. Again, it speaks to the authenticity. But Mary Magdalene, a woman transformed by the life of Jesus, is privileged to see an empty tomb. Again, no fear of associating herself with Jesus. And notice, right, she seeks out the disciples. So in fear that the tomb has been raided, Mary is not simply passing information, but she's asking the disciples, help me find who raided the tomb. It hasn't quite hit Mary what's happened. She's in that first phase, that blepo phase. She sees something, she observes it. But the idea of what has happened has not impacted her truly yet. Verse 3 says, so Peter went out with the other disciple. And they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Now remember, John is the one writing this. He is the other disciple. So I love, I should take a, I should take a moment and recognize the humble brag that John gives. Right? He says, both of them are running. He's the one writing this. And the other disciple outran Peter who reached the tomb. John is literally bragging in scripture that he's faster than Peter. I just think that's kind of a fun point. The humble brag that John gives himself in scripture. But in verse 5, right, we see John take a first note at the scene. Verse 5, he says, In stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Well, John looks into the miracle, but he does not step into it. He's observing, like Mary, just physically observing that something has happened. And we have people every Sunday at our church who are observers. Right, who come and observe, and if that's you, then you're in that blepo phase of seeing Christ merely as an observer. Going through life without the resurrection, really the meaning of the resurrection impacting you. You have observed it preached and talked about, but it, it hasn't hit you the grave importance of, of what it means. These disciples nor Mary yet understood that the stone being rolled away was to display to the world that Jesus was risen. They were just observing and reality had not met them at this point. So it it, kind of reminds me of that blepo phase like being a spectator of of NASCAR, like sitting on the couch. Driving cars looks like a lot of fun. Driving cars at high speed looks like a lot of fun. But from my couch, as I'm spectating it, NASCAR has the same effect on me as Benadryl. Right? And with each lap, it's like another dose. Some of us come to church out of obligation. Some of you, it's out of guilt. Some, it's out of tradition. Or what other reason you have. It may be odd to you as you are sitting here and observing people worshiping a dude who died and rose 2,000 years ago. It may be odd to you. Some of you might be bored out of your mind because you are simply in that blepo phase. You're just merely observing. And the truth of the resurrection and what it means hasn't hit you yet. You have only observed, and thus your empty heart has not been overtaken by an empty tomb. And so if you know that's you, let me ask you, pray. Pray that your empty heart can be taken over by an empty tomb. That the reality, that the significance, that it hits you today. The second point is a closer look. It says, then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there. And the face cloth, which had been placed on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up in a place by itself. 
Here we see Peter actually running into the tomb. And if you know anything about Peter, this is who Peter is. Right? This is exactly who Peter is. John stops to be respectful. Peter runs into the tomb like he's Indiana Jones. Right? We've seen in Scripture, Peter walks on water. He's cutting the ears off of people. He is a go-getter. This is Peter. And it says that he saw the grave clothes like John, but he uses a different Greek word here for the word see. Right? The word used is, is, is theorio which means to behold something attentively or to examine closely. What this word shows is that Peter is perplexed by the scene. He sees not just a stone rolled away, but he sees the face cloth folded, the linen clothes on the ground, and now he's trying to make sense of what is happening or what has happened. I want to explain why this was perplexing. Right? Have you ever come upon a scene and you aren't merely observing, but you're trying to solve the problem in your head? Um, for those who don't know, I have two children, and both of them is, are ornery. Uh, my daughter, she's a sweet girl. My son, Maddox, he's a sweet boy, but he's crazy. And he tries to wake up before me so he can get into the pantry and, and try to scout for things that he, that he likes. And my son likes pancakes, but he doesn't know how to make pancakes. So this one morning, I hear some rustling around. Both kids had gotten up before me, and, and they were early. We get up early as a, as a home. They're up at, at, at 6.30 in the morning. I hear some scrounging around out there. And I go out, and starting at the doorstep of my room, I open the door, and there's powder everywhere. Down the hallway. And I'm trying to make sense of it. Emily, you're laughing because you know my son. He's crazy. So, so she, there, there is powder everywhere, and I'm walking down. I'm, I'm, I'm not just going, oh, there's powder. I'm going to go back to bed. I'm now examining the scene, trying to make sense of it. And I'm walking down. There's powder coming out of the pantry. I'm like, is this flour? And I see that a thing of pancake mix has been opened. There's a big picture of a pancake on it, which I guess intrigued my son. And, I, when, and when it goes, it goes all the way around to the living room, through the carpet, up on the couch, and my son, who is covered in pancake mix, it's in his mouth, it's on his face. He looks at me and goes, Quay did it. <laughs> right, I was examining the scene, trying to make sense of what was happening. So when Scripture says that he saw the linen clothes lying there, right, this word, theorio, which is, is claiming that he's examining, he's looking closely, trying to figure it out. There are, there are some things that would need to be taken into consideration. Right, so when a Jewish man was wrapped up, they put tons and tons of spices on the dead body. They would wrap the spices up on the dead body. And the reason they did this was to keep the, the decomposing body from smelling too bad if you wanted to visit. But if you wanted to visit the body, um, obviously dead bodies can begin to smell. And so this was done as a tradition to make it doable. These spices are very expensive. And so what we see is the linen clothes, which would have been wrapped around the spices, on the floor. Notice what John states about the clothes. He saw the linen clothes lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up in a place by itself. Right, for them to unwrap the clothes, take a decomposing body out, this is neither convenient nor would it make sense. And notice the, the folded head cloth reveals that whoever did this was not in a hurry. They weren't worried about the Roman soldiers guarding the tomb. They folded it up and set it aside. There's no concern. There's no hurry. So again, Peter's examining the meaning of what he's seen. And maybe, maybe that's where some of you guys are at. Some of you may be beyond the point of mere observation of Christianity 
or of the faith or of church or whatever it may be. Maybe you identify with the faith, but you haven't fully committed to it yet. You call yourself a Christian, but an honest observation of your own life and your heart would show a life not defined by a risen Savior. I want you to think about that for a moment. Is your life defined by a risen Savior? Are your motives defined by a living God? You may say, I am a good person. Right? You may say, I am a good person. But listen, Scripture is clear. It says that no man is good, no, not one. That no man is good but God. Scripture says that no one is good and that no one seeks after God without his divine drawing. Right? Some identify because they believe it intellectually. But understand that the Christian faith is more than a mental exercise. The resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus, if it's true, then the impact is more than, than call you to be simply socially good or a moral person defined by culture. The calling is, is, is far greater than that. It's more than to be good, a, a good old boy or a good citizen. The resurrection of Christ wrecks your life. It redefines everything. An empty tomb does not mean that we can merely affiliate ourselves with a cultural Christianity. Again, it demands more. I want to take a moment to examine just real quick. If you're one who is observing, or if you're one who is starting to look more into it, I want to examine real quick the proofs of Jesus' resurrection. Right, first off, we have the impossibility of passing by Roman security. Right, armed guards, Roman a wax seal on the tomb. There was a death penalty for anyone who messed with either. Roman soldiers would check and identify a body before they agreed to guard it to make sure that it was dead. They would seal the tomb with wax. The second point is you have an empty tomb, right? You have Rome and Israel desperately wanting to kill the early movement of Christianity. Which was completely based off of the resurrection. Completely. To do that, all they had to do was produce a body. And they couldn't. You have eyewitnesses, right? whether it's his disciples, whether it's Mary Magdalene, whether it's Paul. You have 500 people at once seeing Jesus. You have the radical change of his followers. Now, I find this fascinating. These disciples go from cowardly, fearful people to courageous real quick. All the disciples, except John, are murdered for their faith, and John is exiled for the rest of his life to an island, and none of them deny the resurrection. Now, understand the resurrection is not true because they were willing to die or not deny, but people are not willing to die for a lie. They, they were willing to die because they believed in what they saw. And something happened in these people's lives to see that transformation. Men who were scared, who were fearful, who now said, my life is yours. My life is wrecked because I understand now an empty tomb. I love this quote by Josephus. Now, now if you know anything about history, he is not... Um, a Christian. He is a Jewish historian. I, I, want to, I want to read this little piece that he wrote. He said, at this time there was, no wise, there was a wise man called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. Many people among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah. I find that interesting, by the way, that this Jewish historian is admitting if what they're saying is true, perhaps he is the Messiah. But he goes on. Concerning whom the prophets have reported wonders, the tribe of the Christians, so named after him, 
have not disappeared to this day. The truth is what we saw is that this tribe of the Christians who follow as resurrected Jesus, it began to grow all because of this resurrection. Because without it, we have nothing to claim. We have no good news without the resurrection of Christ. Without it, the man we call God was killed. And that's all we have. So some of us are observers only. Maybe some of you affiliate loosely. But I want you to think and ask yourself, how has the resurrection impacted you? Men and women have died refusing to proclaim anything other than a risen Christ. Right? Men and women are killed today because they refuse to denounce a risen Jesus. Sadly, often what I find is apathy towards a risen Jesus or people who say they believe yet lack any desire to proclaim Christ. With their hands, with their feet, with their words. And then we see the third point, seeing clearly. John writes in verse 8, he says, Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. And he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. But verse 8 finally gets us to a resurrection, faith and belief. John follows Peter into the tomb, right? And as John gets a closer look, he's not simply observing. He's not only examining. It says he sees and believes. The third time we read the word see here is another Greek word. And it defines itself and it distinguishes it from the rest, right? The Greek word is idion, and it means that, that he understood. When he saw it, when he said, I see it. What he was claiming when he wrote this is that he understood the implications of the empty tomb. Which is why he believed. You see, John had moved from mere observation. He moved from observation to examining, from examining to understanding. Given the message and the evidence, what are the implications on your life? Now, the resurrection happened on a Sunday. It's why we gather on Sundays. It's why the New Testament church gathers together every Sunday to celebrate a risen Christ. It's why some of us are here now And again, it's why some of us are here every week. If the resurrection isn't true, right, then we should pack up all of our stuff because we are wasting our time. I mean that. If we don't believe in the resurrection, then we're wasting our time. Then all of this is empty. Our words and our songs are empty if the resurrection isn't true. I love what Tim Keller says. He says, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like the teachings of Jesus, but whether or not he rose from the dead. If Jesus of Nazareth never arose and he is like every other man. If he did not rise, then Jesus of Nazareth is dead in his sin. A risen Jesus is the only Jesus worth worshiping. A risen Jesus is the only Jesus worth worshiping. Scripture says it best. 
1 Corinthians 15, 17 through 23, he says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, then we are of all people to be most pitied. Scripture says if Christ did not raise from the grave, then we ought to be pitied. The eternal implications of this historical event are huge. And you cannot afford to be unimpacted by it. Because if it's false, then all the faith is a lie. But if it's true, then nothing will be the same again. Once you really accept it as true, and understand its implications, nothing again will be the same. I love this last verse of John 20 and verse 10. I love it. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Then the disciples went back to their homes. They saw. They believed. The implications of a risen Jesus hit them but life went on as the next day came about right, we titled the sermon back to life and it has two meanings not only does back to life point to the resurrection but it points to all of us here the resurrection cannot leave us unchanged it will make us obedient servants of Jesus or skeptic enemies of the gospel After this, this Easter service, some of you will go off and eat, but all of us are going to go back to our homes. Like the disciples, we will go back home. We'll go back to life. But let me ask you again, how has your life been impacted by the resurrection? The fact that you deserve death for your sin and God himself paid a debt that you cannot pay. But we do not worship a crucified Savior. We worship a risen Christ. A victorious Jesus in which we share in that victory. Listen, if you're listening now. If you are listening now. And if you know in your heart that you have not fully understood or accepted the implications of an empty tomb, if you are a mere observer or at best affiliated yourself with Christ without understanding the resurrection, if you know in your heart that you have not been transformed by the truth of the gospel, then no scripture says that you are not alive but that you are dead in your trespasses. It does not matter how good you think you are. says that you were dead in your trespasses. The truth of a risen Jesus changes everything. The life we go back to tomorrow should not look the same. Our ministries, for those who are in Christ, who are part of the body of Christ, our ministry should not look the same. Why we do things, why we serve. We have wonderful people serving now, and they're not doing it to make me happy or to make you happy. They're doing it out of worship. We listen and read scripture out of worship because of a God who conquered death so that we could have life. So before you go back home, before you go back to your life, make sure you see and believe that your murdered Savior now lives. Before you leave, make sure you see that your murdered Savior is alive. And that the full implications and the weight of the resurrection fall upon you. And when that happens, there's a freedom and a rejoicing that I cannot simply describe in words. When you understand the weight of a living God who has taken away all of your sin and guilt and your shame. 
I got a phone call this week of a, of a student that I used to teach. And I thought this man was a follower of Jesus. We'd hung out, and I got a phone call. And I remember, right, I'll never forget the joy in his voice as he said to me, I understand the gospel. The implications of a risen Jesus hit him. He thought he understood, but it hit him square in the heart. It had brought about not only repentance, but pure joy and hope. Understand that through his death, your death was conquered. And for those who believe through his resurrection, right, we can now walk in the newness of life. That we're not shackled by our sins of old. But that we can charge the gates of hell knowing that Christ is victorious. I want to close with the reading of Romans 6, 7-11. through I want you to listen to it carefully. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Praise be to God alone, forever and ever.